Uh, welcome to another Coffee with Samso. Uh, today I've again got um, Rick Rule, who's uh, generous enough to give me some time. Um, a catch up. The last session we had was disastrous uh, in terms of technology. So today I think we, we'll, we'll try and win that game. Uh, how's things, Rick? How, how's, how's things in the US? You know, life is, uh, life is for me pretty good. Uh, I'm not trying to belittle the problem that other people are having. You know, uh, millions of people are laid off and uh, thousands of people have died, hundreds of thousands of people are sick. Uh, for me in particular, life is almost embarrassingly easy. I want you to know too that I got dressed appropriately for the occasion. Ah. I have EMSO glasses on, but now I'll take them off so I can see. <laughs> no. Life, life, is, um, life is surprisingly good right now. It's fun to be in the Sprout organization. Um, uh, and while I feel horrible about the millions of people around the world who are inconvenienced by this, when the question applies to me personally, uh, life is very good. Yeah. So, um, so if all, for Rick Rule, for Sprout, has the dust settled in terms of the market? I mean, the last time we spoke, it was sort of right at the, at the start of things. Uh, I guess there's two questions there, uh, really. For us, the market hasn't settled at all because we're having amazing amounts of inbound traffic to Sprott, buying various Sprott investment products. So uh, we joke that we worked a decade to be overnight successes. Yeah. In the broad market, in the U.S. at least, the markets have been given levitation by quantitative easing and, in fact, direct Fed buying. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I watched the Fed walk into the uh, junk bond market, the high yield bond market. The markets were effectively no bid, and all of a sudden, monster bids showed up in the index funds, which caused the managers, of course, to have to buy the underlying products. It's just amazing to see what a buyer can do when he or she operates in scale with free money. Um, I don't think our markets are out of the woods yet by any stretch of the imagination because the only buyer there is the Fed uh, and people who are tape chasers. Uh, but it's certainly a different feeling market with the very heavy end of the Fed in place. We're nervous, of course, because we don't think that other equity investors have concerned themselves too much with the impact of the economic slowdown uh, on public company balance sheets. Uh, we believe that this decline in sales will lead to decline in margins and will uh, lead to a decline in the ability to service debt at all levels of society. But for right now, the market is very buoyant, uh, very buoyant, pardon me, and we expect precious metals markets, while volatile, will also continue to be buoyant. I mean, I've had conversations with people, obviously, everyone's a, a, a genius now forecasting, you know, the markets and things like that. And someone said, oh, look, you know, now we're sort of in Australia, our, our, our fortunately, our cases, a number of cases are almost zero. And, and now that goes on. And the next thing is now, you know, we're, we're going to go and see how bad the market is. But I'm just thinking, I mean, don't you know how bad this market's going to be already? Um, so it, what, what's your comment to that? Well, I'm afraid, uh, as I suspect you are. Uh, I need to say I'm not an economist. Uh, I'm actually a credit analyst. But if you are a credit analyst and you look at society's ability, uh, that is some individuals, governments, <laughs> public companies, if you look at their ability to service their debts outstanding with the free cash flows that should be left with massive unemployment and declining demand, you need to be concerned. Uh, you need to be very concerned. I don't want to comment on the continuing uh, medical impact of the virus because I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a virologist. I just flat don't know. But what I do know in the United States is that there are millions of people out of work and there are hundreds of thousands of businesses shut down. Uh, but there are bank loans outstanding and bonds that need to be serviced. And from my point of view, that's a fairly ugly combination. It would seem that the markets are looking at two things, the Fed, you know, the old U.S. saying, don't fight the Fed, and the fact that there's plenty of liquidity in the market now. And I am afraid that investors that don't have a credit background are confusing liquidity, that is cash in the system, with solvency. 
And those are actually very different words. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, in your, in your opinion, in your, you know, man of years, decades of wise wisdom, um, when we restart, you know, wh wherever you are, whether in Europe, US or in Australia, what's, what's, what sector is the bad, what sector is the worst, and what sector, what sector is the, oh my gosh. Uh, I really don't know, to be honest with you. I'm not being silly. Yeah. The, the sector that is the best for me right now is precious metals. Uh, there are no certainties in life. I've learned that after 67 years, but there are probabilities. And the probability is that the policy response to an economic slowdown will be continued quantitative easing, which is to say counterfeiting, uh, continued low or in fact negative real interest rates, and a continued deterioration of central government balance sheets. And all of those policy responses are very good for gold. Gold has, of course, outpaced the precious metal stocks, although maybe not in Australia, but in the rest of the world. And uh, this will be my ninth recovery in the gold business from oversold bottoms. In every prior case, save one, uh, the gold stocks were delayed in terms of their response to the move in precious metals by as much as nine months. And given the fact that we expect precious metals prices to continue to move higher, that isn't to say without volatility, uh, we believe that precious metals stocks, precious metals equities will play catch up. So certainly for the next year or 18 months, uh, I would suggest that portfolios need to be overweight uh, precious metals. I would be concerned about companies that, uh, irrespective of the sector, uh, operated with uh, small margins uh, and you know, high debt. So I might be concerned. Well, I won't, I won't go into the sectors, but I'm, I'm not a general market analyst. But I think that this is a time when you would want to invest in much, much, much more uh, conservative businesses. And I would also urge, as I did the last time you and I interviewed, your holders to keep reasonable amounts of cash. While I understand that quantitative easing uh, reduces the purchasing power of that cash as time goes on. In the near term, I would define near term as 18, sort of 12 to 18 months. Uh, having cash will give you both the tools and the courage to take advantage of this volatility rather than being taken advantage of by the volatility. Yeah, there's, but there's not too many people who fit in that category though, Rick. <laughs> Well, uh, I guess that's their fault. Uh, more people, I, I think, should read uh, Nassim Taleb and Anti-Fragile uh, and understand that uh, even in reasonably benign times, tough things happen. And I'm not certain that these are even benign times right now. So tough things will continue to happen and people need to prepare themselves for it. Okay. Um, I guess, you know, like, like if, if I were to give you one word and you just make a comment, um, like in, in a sector like the banks, what, what do you think? What's, what's your you know, short paragraph summary? Depends on the bank. There is not a one size fits all circumstance. Banks have been taught to be highly leveraged and they have been taught that governments will bail them out. And I suspect the governments will attempt to bail them out again. There are certain individual banks here in the United States, uh, Farmers and Merchants Bank of Long Beach comes to mind. Regional banks uh, still run by the controlling family that are old fashioned banks. They have money in them. Uh, they make loans with the intent of getting paid back. And those banks are gonna do fantastically well because other banks that have credit problems aren't going to be able to make new loans even to very, very good borrowers. Mm -hmm. And so a well-run bank, uh, I think, will absolutely thrive in this circumstance. It's just that banking is such a complex business and it tends to be so over leveraged that the title well-run bank uh, is almost an oxymoron these days. I don't know the Australian banks well enough to comment anymore. Uh, I used to actually uh, trade in the Australian banks in the 90s, but I haven't paid attention to them for fully 30 years. Um, I guess, you know, how about companies like Amazon? I mean, obviously they're reporting great profits and turnover. What's your thoughts on those, that group of companies? I'm concerned about the tech sector generally. Uh, I'm concerned about the fact that a lot of the valuation that occurred in the tech sector 
like in the mineral exploration sector, was highly speculative. Uh, and if we have a circumstance where a business is growing very rapidly, but on low margins, the idea that it's capital intensive, that it requires cheap capital and its margins are under pressure really scares me. Now I say that freely acknowledging that I've been afraid of Amazon for 20 years. And if I've been anything, it's consistently wrong with regards to Amazon. And perhaps I'm more nervous about businesses that I don't understand. I can tell you this about Amazon. I'm not a happy customer. I'm an ecstatic customer. Uh, I love the prices. I love the service. Uh, the technology is simple enough that even a 67 year old Ludite like me uh, <laughs> can operate on it. So uh, I'm happy about the business, but I don't know enough to own the stock. Okay, fair enough. Um, we've touched on, on companies like New Chris. I mean, to me, those kind of gold companies um, is an obvious, is an obvious um, understanding that you'll do well. I don't know whether that's a safe comment to make. I think, I don't know, you, you're, you're the man. I, I don't think there's any such thing as a safe comment when you're looking about the, looking to the future. Warren Buffett famously says that predictions tell you a lot about the predictor, but not very much at all about the future. Yeah. Investors want certainty and there's no such thing. But I think the probabilities are that the bigger and better Australian producers will do fabulous. Uh, their costs are denominated in Australian dollars, which are falling, which means to say that their input cost is falling. Their energy costs have been cut in half and their product price in Australian dollars is soaring. It's kind of tough to screw up rapidly increasing margins. I would also say over the last 10 years that Australian gold companies have been better run than other gold companies. I'm tempted to look back 20 years, but many, many of the disastrous capital expenditures and merger and acquisition strategies that crippled the North American industry uh, weren't as popular in Australia 20 years ago. Uh, I, I believe, frankly, and my North American friends will hate me for saying this, the um, money-making ethos in mining in Australia was purer. The idea was rocks to money. In North America, it became perverted, rocks to stocks and stocks to money. And too many companies in North America were operated with a view merely to increasing the share price in the near term, rather than increasing the value of the company. I was always impressed in Australia with the continuing discussion of net present value and free cash flow. <laughs> So I would argue that the Australians will continue to outperform their international peers, both because the ethos in Australia is more geared towards making money and also because of this wonderful combination of low and declining Australian dollar in the face of rapidly increasing gold prices in Australian dollars. So a wonderful combination, hard to screw it up. Even I couldn't screw it up. It's like, like organizing a piss up in a brewery, is it? <laughs> Is that an invitation, Sam? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, I'm, and and I guess the next one I was keen to get uh, your view is real estate because um, we we just just last week we just had a, a relaxation of our rules and a, a colleague of mine, an associate of mine, just there was our first house opening and he said, "Look, I sold two. I'm going, oh, wow, you know, maybe everyone's been locked up for for four weeks and couldn't go to a house open and suddenly just decide to buy a house. So what's, what's, your, what's your view? The real estate business has always been very good to me. So, you know, I, I have to say from my own point of view, I've been reasonably prudent too. I think uh, your success in real estate will have to do with what kind of real estate investor you are. I wouldn't want to be willy nilly in the sector, particularly in Australia where the real estate prices have gone up straight up for 25 years. But if you have the ability in today's interest rates to buy yourself a, a rental property in a good market where your cost of capital is fixed, that is to say your, margin, your, your cost of capital for 20 or 30 years is fixed with a fixed mortgage, while your return on capital employed, the rents that you're uh, able to charge go up by two or 3% a year, that's a fairly virtuous outcome. <laughs> if you're well enough capitalized to handle the volatility 
And if you're relatively experienced, you make money in a business by adding value. There are some real estate investors that can look at a house and figure out if they change the curb appeal, if they change the paint color, if they do something that they can increase the rents. Mm. Uh, I think as a sector, it's been so good for so long that the expectation of success is built in the sector. So for many investors, the starting price is too high. But for people who are experienced, who can buy a, a, an income stream that's rising gradually with a fixed cost of capital, that's a fairly virtuous uh, idea. I, I know you're short of time today. Um, and um, we, we, the last time we spoke, you mentioned uranium. And uh, just recently, I've had guys tell me, oh, there's two uranium IPO happening. Oh, really? Um, it's the furthest thing that I thought would be happening in this time. Is there something in that industry that, I mean, I know you're, not, you're, you're well versed in it. That's why I, I, I'm bringing it up. Is there something happening? Um, I mean, the short answer is no. Uh, we are setting up the classic contrarian rebound uh, in that demand got obliterated by Fukushima. And we're we're managing the disparity between supply and demand by obliterating supply. And when you balance supply and demand by obliterating supply in capital intensive businesses, you set up a, just a rip your face off rally because when the uranium price begins to go up, the industry can't increase production rapidly to satisfy the pricing signals. It takes five years or six years. So the shutdowns by Cameco, by Kazataprom, by others are, of course, very, very beneficial. Um, I think what's moving the uranium market, the, the market for uranium equities is two things. First of all, the price of uranium has moved up from $24 to $34. In other words, it's gone up from suicidal to merely catastrophic. The industry doesn't survive at $34. But we've taken a lot of supply out of the market. So the stage is set uh, 18 months from now or so for it to go higher. What I think is really moving the equities, however, is memories of the last uranium bull market. And the fact that there's a relatively large subset of speculators, myself included, who enjoyed spectacular success in that market and want to enjoy that same success one more time before they die. Uh, it give those of us who participated in that market any excuse at all to dream of doing it again, uh, we get so excited we lose sleep. Uh, and so I think you have a sector where the market capitalization is tiny, uh, that has had no bid for five or six years, and you're beginning to see bids. You've also seen a circumstance, Sam, so over the last five years, where the market has been so skinny that the shares outstanding have gone from weak hands, uh, uncommitted hands, to extraordinarily strong hands. Uh, and I suspect that many of these shares are owned by people who have no intention of selling them even at three or four times today's price. So that the indicated floats are very different uh, than the actual floats. I mean, an example, you look at uh, Wilton, which is controlled by Li Kai-shen. Um, you know, the guy doesn't have to look at the uh, right side of the menu where the prices are <laughs> for anything. He's a committed long-term buyer. And if uh, he believes that something's going to happen with the uranium price, which he obviously does given his investments, uh, the idea that a stock went from a dollar to a dollar 50 is of no earthly in interest to him. And I think that's another reason. I think these stocks are very, very tight because they're very well and very closely held. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, I saw a video once and you mentioned about our, bon our, our bonds. Uh, I, I was uh, instantly amused with that. I, I want to, to end this conversation. I'd love, love for you to describe that to, to people. I'm afraid you're going to see it pretty soon in the junk market. Uh, an owl bond is a thinly traded bond in a bad bond market. And I call them owl bonds because if you own them and you get afraid and you want to sell them and you call your broker and say, please sell my bond, your broker says, to who, to who. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's a good, good way to end a bit of humor. 
that, that can be mining stocks in a skinny market too. There is such a thing as an owl stock. <laughs> I was just going to say that it's, it's a, 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 um, a lot of similarities to some stocks. <laughs> All right, Rick. Um, look, thank you for giving time. I'm really glad. Um, keep well, keep safe. And you. Let's, let's hope to do this again sometime. Well, uh, listen, when they, uh, when they ever let me fly again, uh, I'm uh, intending to come to your way. I've spent a lot of time in both Australia and New Zealand, and frankly, I miss it. So at some point in time, uh, I'll do uh, coffee with Samso. Uh, in the real sense, I'll have coffee with Samso, and I look forward to that. I, I just did one yesterday in, in this same, same place, and uh, we couldn't have coffee because we're not allowed to consume in the it's, – it's like a cafe, right? So, so, so the guy that came says, oh, really? I was looking forward to the coffee. So, <laughs> all right, on that note, uh, Rick, thank you, and uh, keep safe. We'll, we'll, we'll talk again. Always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.